doing today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the Technical Group Manager of the Radiological Materials Group in the Nuclear Sciences Division at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the Chair of the Gen4 International Forum Education and Training Task Force. Without any further ado, I let Patricia do the introduction. Thank you so much, Berta. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to have uh, Mr. Guillaume Corrick uh, giving his talk uh, today on the interactions between the sodium and fission products in case of a severe accident scenario. Uh, he's one of the three students who won the elevator pitch challenge contest at the last GIF symposium meeting in October 2018 in Paris. And as a result, he has been awarded to give this presentation. Mr. Corrick is a second year PhD student at the CEA Saclay in France in the Laboratory of Modeling of Thermodynamics and Thermochemistry. His PhD research aims at investigating the chemical interactions between the mixed oxide fuel, fission products, and sodium for the safety assessment of the sodium cool fast reactor. In case of a severe accident, as the chemical system contains many elements, the Kalfan method approach is the most suitable to develop a model for the safety study. The first year of his PhD was spent at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, and he investigated the fission product sodium interactions. He's currently doing the second year of his PhD at the Joint Research Center in Karlsruhe on the experimental study of the sodium MOX fuel interaction. And finally, the last year will be done in the CES Saclay to build a CALFAN model on the different system under study. His research activities are funded by the CEA and also by the European Nuclear Education Network CLUX program. They are based on the multidisciplinary approach, combining experimental work and modeling. In 2017, he graduated from Chimie Paris Tech, ENSCP, with a diploma of engineering option chemistry of materials, and from the INSTN with a master's degree in nuclear engineering, option fuel cycle. So thank you so much, uh, Guillaume, for volunteering to give this uh, webinar, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. So thank you for this introduction. And uh, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my presentation about the interactions between sodium and fission products in case of a severe accident in a sodium cool fast reactor. But uh, before starting, I would like to thank uh, first the Generation 4 International Forum to give me the opportunity to do this presentation uh, on the work that I have achieved during my first year of uh, PhD in Delft in the Netherlands under uh, the supervision of Anna Smith. So I would also like to thank uh, Anna Smith, uh, also my PhD director, Christine Geno, working at CSA Clay, and uh, also Rudy Konings and Karin Popa, my supervisor in uh, GRC Karlsruhe in Germany, <coughs> where <coughs> I am here right now. Um, so I will start this presentation with uh, a description of the context of my PhD topic. Uh, then I will uh, explain what is the Kalfan method and why this uh, semi-empirical method is uh, relevant for my study. But to understand this technique, you need some basics on Gibbs energy models. Uh, and finally, I will show you how to get input data for the modeling. So input data about structure, phase diagram, or thermo thermodynamic. And of course, at the end, I will conclude. So let's start with the context of my PhD topic. So my work is about sodium cool fast reactors. So here you have a scheme of uh, the sodium cool fast reactor. So I will not go into details on how this reactor is operated because previous webinars uh, were describing it. But for my study, there is one point that is really important is that the here, the core, is cooled with sodium. And so you have uh, the fuel pellets then uh, the, that we can see here, the cladding, 
and then just after the cladding you have the sodium so i was talking about a fuel pellet but uh, this design of reactor uses mixed oxide fuel so uranium 1 minus 6 plutonium x o2 with a plutonium content uh, between 20 or 30 percent in uh, weight percentage of plutonium and under irradiation the fission of uh, these heavy atoms uh, will release energy and create what we call uh, fission products compounds uh, of fission products and uh, moreover during uh, this uh, irradiation there will be a restructuration of the pellets as we can see here for example with uh, a formation of uh, a hole in the middle or some cracks uh, over over there in the whole pellets and this will have an effect uh, and uh, so the fission products formed can be classified in uh, in different families because every fission products will have its own behavior and you can distinguish four families so the first one is the fission gases and other volatile fission products like iodine for example uh, you have also the fission products forming metallic precipitates like molybdenum or tellurium for example uh, the third family is the fission products dissolved in the fuel matrix like strontium and finally uh, the fission products forming oxide precipitates like cesium, barium, molybdenum and tellurium. So uh, there is a very large thermal gradient between the uh, center of the pellet that is uh, can uh, can be like a 2000 degrees C uh, and the outskirt of the pellet that is generally uh, around uh, 650 uh, degrees C and this uh, will uh, induce the migration of volatile fission products towards the cold parts of the fuel pellet. And there, they will uh, recondense, forming what we call the joint oxygen layer. So mainly formed uh, by cesium, molybdenum, barium, tellurium, and oxygen. And as we can see here, in this layer, so here, we don't have any uranium nor plutonium, but uh, the main uh, compounds are cesium, molybdenum, oxygen, and the most st stable uh, phase, uh, thermodynamic stable phase there is the CS2MO4. Um, another phase can be found in the irradiated fuel uh, called the gray phase, which is uh, so barium strontium. Uh, so combined with zirconium, molybdenum, uranium, plutonium, oxygen free. And uh, this, these phases will be really understood during these presentations. Um, so here is a scheme of uh, the different uh, thermodynamic stable phases and their operation for the cesium, barium, molybdenum and tellurium, which are the elements that we will focus on uh, along this work. So now that you have an idea of what we have inside the irradiated fuel thanks to thermodynamic calculations uh, we can start with uh, what will happen during a severe accident so uh, let's start uh, let's start with a definition of uh, what is a severe accident so a severe accident is happening when the reactor fuel is significantly damaged with more or less extensive melting of the reactor core. So here you can have you can see a scheme uh, of one of uh, scenario uh, of uh, severe accidents, so called the total inlet blockage. So this type of accident starts with a blockage of the inlets of the cooling system. Therefore, there is no more flow of sodium, and only after 2.5 seconds. Uh, the sodium will start boiling. And after four seconds, the vaporization is total. And just a few seconds later, later, you have so the clads, so the barrier between uh, the sodium and uh, the fuel that will start uh, melting. Uh, and then 
only after 10 seconds after the beginning of the, the accident, the fuel will start melting and to end up with what we call a boiling pool where after only 15 seconds, the steel will start boiling. So depending on the scenario, you can have this type of boiling pool or fuel ejection uh, into sodium. Uh, therefore, uh, you can have interactions between sodium and fission products compounds that we saw previously, uh, but also interaction between sodium and mixed oxide fuel and volatile fission products release. So today, this talk will be focused on the sodium fission products interactions, but uh, because that's what I have studied during my first year of PhD, but now in Jersey Karlsruhe, I'm currently studying the sodium mixed oxide fuel interaction. So as I was saying previously, you have different scenarios. So you can find three different types of severe accident scenarios. The first one called the unprotected loss of coolant, so ULOF, is uh, where the sodium is biphasic for uh, some, peri some periods before a total vaporization. Then uh, you have also the unprotected transient over power, so UTOP, where there is a slight increase in the sodium temperature, but what is important is it is still liquid. And the total inlet blockage that I showed you uh, in the previous slide, where the sodium quickly vaporizes. Um, moreover, when you describe a severe accident, you have to take into account two time scales. So the first one is the short term effects, where you have uh, to control the mechanical energy release during the accident in order to avoid the break of the confinement uh, and the release of radioactive materials uh, in the environment. And then, so when you, you have also the long term effects that deals with the management of the core after the accident. In fact, you have to be sure that a fission reaction will not start again after the accident. Therefore, the scope of the study is uh, really the safety assessments of the sodium cooled fast reactors with different axes. So the first one is the sodium mixed oxide fuel and fission products interaction at all stages of the severe accident. You also have to assess the consequences of a complete loss of the fuel peak tightness. So what's happening when you have a boiling pool of irradiated materials? Uh, you have to answer basically two questions. Uh, which fission products are released? And is there an interaction with sodium? And finally, you have also to manage the molten pool formed after the interaction between sodium and irradiated fuel in a severe accident scenario. So basically, which compounds are formed during the cooling down of the core. So more practically, during this PhD project, I am studying cesium, strontium, barium, iodine, tellurium, molybdenum, uranium, plutonium, oxygen, and all these systems in interaction with sodium. So just by saying this, we can understand that it is a real complex system. And moreover, you have to study it on a large range of compositions and temperatures from 600 to more than 3000 uh, degrees C. Therefore, there is a huge need for thermodynamic modeling of the interaction between the fuel, fission products and liquid sodium at the different stages of a severe accident scenario. In fact, uh, the final goal is to describe the effect of temperature and oxygen potential on the, on the interaction between sodium and the different fission products compounds. Because in fact, these two parameters are key factors for the phase formation in the systems. And to develop this thermonic model, we will use the Kalfan method. So what is the Kalfan method? So, this technique provides a thermodynamic description of the system, and this thermodynamic description can be used to calculate its chemical properties. 
and it is based on the minimization of the Gibbs energy of uh, the gas, liquid, and solid phases as a function of the temperature, pressure, and composition of the system. But of course, before going further on the CALFAT description, I will introduce what is the Gibbs energy of a system. So the Gibbs energy can be defined by, so the enthalpy H here, which re represents the heat content of a system, minus the temperature multiplied by the entropy of the system, which has for physical meaning the randomness of uh, the system. And in thermodynamics, you have a lot of relations. And thanks to this, you can also express it with the internal energy of the system, which is uh, basically the kinetic and potential energies of your, at of your atoms. Uh, so this G function is really the key function in the thermodynamics of materials, because you can describe the evolution of your system with this and derive the equilibrium state of your system. In fact, at constant temperature and pressure, a closed system will be in stable equilibrium if it has the lowest value of the Gibbs energy. And uh, we have the, in this point, we have the derivative of uh, G that is uh, zero. But as we can see here on this uh, diagram, uh, it's possible that sometimes you have uh, different states, uh, equi different equilibrium where the derivative of G is uh, zero, but only one will be at the lowest value. And this one, so A, is the lowest val possible value of G. So this is the st st stable equilibrium. Whereas B is what we call a metastable equilibrium state because uh, the derivative of G is uh, zero but it's not the lowest possible value of G. Um, and also uh, this uh, G function is really useful in the thermodynamics uh, relations because you can derive many other quantities thanks to the G function. And so in your system, in case you have several phases, uh, the total Gibbs energy is obtained by linear combination of the Gibbs energies of each phases. And therefore, you have the principle of the Kalfan method, that is to optimize the G function of each phase by a least square minimization method to match the experimental data in order to be able to model your whole system. And as we are basing our modeling on the experimental data, this is a semi-empirical method. But in your system, you're also taking into account liquid phases. And so we also need to model the Gibbs energy. And of course, a liquid cannot be modeled as a solid because uh, the constituents have no fixed environments and also the number of uh, nearest neighbor can change in a liquid. Uh, so I will not go into details, but you can describe the G function for liquid with three terms. So one term called the G reference, another term called the G ideal. So this is uh, if you have a liquid that is uh, taken as an ideal solution. So there are no interactions between the compounds uh, in solutions. And uh, what we call a G uh, excess, that is representative of uh, these uh, interactions with an interaction parameter L. And you can see on the different graphs that this interaction parameter is really, really important because, for example, uh, if you put a negative parameter, you have a stabilization. But if you put a positive parameter, you have uh, phase separation, and you can see that the shape of the curves are totally different. So phase separation with the formation of two phases, so BCC1 and BCC2, the other two phases formed with a phase separation. So just to have 
a more visual uh, idea of what is the Kalfan method. So here you can find the experimental parts, so the experimental data. So you can get, as I was saying in the introduction, uh, experiment experimental data from structure, phase diagram, or thermodynamics. And the structural uh, data will uh, help us choosing correctly uh, the model of uh, your system in your uh, in your uh, mod modeling. Uh, and uh, the phase diagram data and the thermodynamics data will help you in the model to optimize uh, the parameters uh, and get um, so the G functions of uh, your different uh, phases that you will store in a database. And this database, you will use it then to do to perform some calculations. So all kind of uh, applications that you can have, and then which is super nice, uh, you have uh, you can feed your experimental data also with uh, the modeling parts. But at the, begin, as, at the beginning, there is a huge need for experimental thermodynamic measurements because otherwise you cannot build your model. So we have uh, a database called the TAF-ID that is a, an international project where many binaries and ternaries are reported. Uh, so in uh, green, uh, you can see all the binaries or ternaries all that are reported in this TAF ID uh, project. So we can see that almost all binary systems have been modeled, whereas the ternary phase diagram are missing, except we have CSMOO, BAMOO, and UPUO. So these are some of very uh, important uh, phase diagram for uh, the study uh, of uh, the system. However, in this database, the sodium is not uh, included. Therefore, I had to perform some literature review on the sodium system. And again, we have the same conclusion. Many binaries uh, are modeled, but only few ternaries. We have uh, the sodium uranium oxygen system that is uh, also really uh, a key, key system for the study and the sodium uh, molybdenum oxygen system. So now that we know what we have, we can start performing experiments uh, to get some uh, data for the Calfan modeling. So now I will show you how to get experimental results to feed your database, uh, to feed your model and then your database. So, okay. So we will start with the barium sodium molybdenum oxygen system. So we, if you remember uh, the beginning of the presentation, I was showing you some uh, phases that are stable. Uh, in the irradiated fuel. And the two phases, barium molybdenum of three and barium molybdenum of four, are found in the irradiated fuel. So the three dissolved in the gray phase, and the barium molybdenum of four in the joint oxygen. Uh, however, there, are, there is no thermodynamic data on the interaction between these phases and sodium. But we have some Calfan models available that are barium molybdenum oxygen, sodium molybdenum oxygen, and barium sodium. So it would be a, we, will, we would be able, with some uh, experiments on the quaternary phase diagram, to get the, the modeling of this uh, phase diagram. So one quaternary compound was reported in the literature, which is barium-2 sodium molybdenum O5.5. But only structural data were reported. Therefore, we decided to synthesize these uh, compounds by solid state synthesis at uh, 800 degrees C under dry oxygen, uh, starting from barium molybdate, barium carbonate, and sodium carbonate. 
to get the pure compound and then to perform then uh, thermodynamic measurements. And when you do a synthesis like this, the first way to control the purity of your sample is from the X-ray diffraction method. So in fact, we obtain the crystalline materials and this type of materials are made of repeating planes that you can see here uh, in all directions. And they can be described with what we call a space group and cell parameters. And when X-rays are hitting the sample, depending on the incident angle, they will be scattered or not. And by collecting the scattered X-rays, you can get a pattern that is uh, like this usually, that is really a fingerprint of uh, the materials. Because then you, you can, on this pattern, you can uh, perform what we call the Rydvelt refinement of uh, your pattern. And this will give you uh, the space group and lattice parameters of your sample. And as we can see here, we cannot see any additional peaks. Therefore, the compound was really pure. And then we uh, also performed uh, some neutron diffraction measurements. So for the neutron diffraction, it is exactly the same principle than X-ray diffraction, but you're using neutrons instead of X-rays. Therefore, the neutron will be scattered by the atomic nuclei and not the electronic density surrounding the nucleus. And thanks to that, you can get the, you can see really the atomic positions of the light atoms. Uh, so that's what we performed. And again, a real refinement to get them. And you can see that uh, no additional peaks were, was, uh, was found. Uh, and finally, another method uh, has been used on this compound called the X-ray absor absorption spectroscopy. So, uh, the absorption of X-rays at a specified energy induces the ejection that you can see here of uh, an electron from the core. And this you have, uh, this is corresponding to a, a jump in uh, the absorption curve. And this jump is characteristic of the oxidation state of the chemical elements. So, we performed this for uh, our quaternary compounds. And uh, also you need some references uh, with a different oxidation state. So here is zero, here is four, and here is six. And thanks to these uh, references and the measurements of our quaternary compounds, uh, we found out that molybdenum was six in this structure. And so combining, well, is it work? Okay, so combining all this uh, information, uh, so X ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, and X ray absorption spectroscopy, you can have a precise determination of your structure like this. So, this is really how the, the crystal looks like uh, in our container compound with uh, sodium, molybdenum, and uh, uh, barium atoms and oxygen. And thanks to this uh, structure representation, you can choose uh, the appropriate sublattice model for the CalFAD modeling, which is basically how you will uh, model your structure in, in the software. And as I was saying, the purity of the sample was good enough for thermodynamic measurements, so we performed them. Uh, we performed some. But before, uh, but before we did, ah, um, so before we did some uh, 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 high temperature X-ray diffraction measurements. Um, so I don't know if I can come back. No. Um, so, well, uh, it was just to see how the compound was swelling and, uh, and, uh, so, uh, to, to know, 
uh, so the evolution of the compound uh, with the temperature. Um, and so you have just had the time to see quickly the, the, the graph, but uh, the quaternary compounds was uh, way more, uh, the way more, um, well, the curve for the quaternary compound was uh, way more important than for the ternaries. So this has to be taken into account in the, in the um, thermodynamic safety calculations. So then we performed, uh, so what we call the standard enthalpy of formation measurements uh, with uh, a solution calorimetry. So for this, uh, in fact, you have some, you put some sample in an ampoule that you put then in the reactor vessel, uh, and then you will uh, crush it like here. And in fact, when a compound is dissolving, uh, you release an energy uh, called by the dissolution reactions. Uh, and this energy can be measured uh, with the calorimeter. Uh, however, to measure it precisely, uh, you need a first electrical calibration and also a second electrical calibration. So then you have the energy uh, released of uh, one uh, one reaction, and then you can perform a thermodynamic cycle uh, using uh, this uh, the, just a basic math uh, to obtain so this uh, reaction, which is called the the reaction of formation of um, the the quaternary compounds, and this uh, enthalpy will be uh, the uh, enthalpy of formation of your compound. But of course, to get this, you have to measure all the enthalpy, uh, enthalpy of reaction of uh, all your reactions, so one, two, three, four, and five, and then you can sum them to get it in the end. So now we'll just do a quick recall on the Calfan modeling. Um, so you can find again the G function, but uh, expressed uh, differ differently. Like uh, with uh, the standard enthalpy of formation. So here is uh, so the H term. Uh, and this is what we measured uh, with uh, the, the, um, uh, with uh, our cotton rib compounds. Uh, you have also the standard entropy. Uh, so the S term multiplied by T, and also what we call the heat capacity. So as I was saying previously, uh, the G function is, uh, you have a lot of relation uh, using the G function. That's why other measurements are useful, like standard entropy measurements, heat capacity evolution at high temperature, low temperature, melting temperature, phase diagram data, enthalpy of melting. Well, the more experimental data you have, the more accurate modeling you will get. And this is really a key point of the Calfan modeling. So now that I show you how to get some input data about the structure, I will explain you what I will do in my last year of PhD. So on one of the model, uh, so the barium sodium molybdenum oxygen system. So in the Calfan model, uh, to build the Calfan model, uh, the first step is uh, to model the binary subsystems. Then, so this, uh, as we showed in the table, uh, is done. Then the second step is to model the ternary subsystems. So like uh, here, for example, so between barium oxide and molybdenum O3. Um, so this is uh, nearly done, like we have some models, but uh, some are missing. And then the first step is to model the quaternary uh, system. And at each step, uh, you have to determine the G functions for all the compounds and the interaction parameters for the solutions, which is a lot of work. So now let's go on the second system. So the one with cesium, sodium, molybdenum, oxygen system. So why are you interested in cesium? So this 
uh, fission product is very volatile and it has an important radiological impact on the environment if released. Uh, so you have to know what's going to happen to the cesium in case of a severe accident. So you have two quaternary compounds in this system. So we did exactly the same uh, structural measurements, but I will not uh, detail them here. I will more focus on the study of the pseudo-binary phase diagram CS2MO4 and A2MO4. In fact, CS2MO4 is the main phase uh, expecting in the joint acid gain. And therefore, uh, in case of a severe accident, you could have a substitution of sodium into this uh, uh, CS2MO4 or a reaction between the sodium and these compounds. Moreover, uh, on the pseudo-binary phase diagram, uh, CS2MO4 and A2MO4, one of the quaternary compounds uh, exists on this pseudo-binary. So you had two uh, reasons to, uh, to study this. And you will be, it will be used to uh, build the Calfan model also. And to study, to get the phytogram data, we used differential scanning calorimetry measurements. So basically, you put your sample here with a reference here, and you will hit them at the same time, at the same temperature. So if you, here you have a picture in a more uh, real way. <laughs> and uh, so if some, something is happening to your sample, like phase transitions, a tactic, uh, liquidus transitions, uh, you will release energy again. And this energy, you will see it here on the heat flow uh, measurements. Uh, where you have you will have a peak like this, for example, and so this is a typical DSC measurement of a mixture of uh, Na2MO4, CS2MO4 in this uh, ratio, and you can see that you have two phase transitions, one atectic and one liquidus here. So we performed uh, several measurements with uh, different. Um, uh, composition of uh, Na2MO4, CS2MO4, and so we obtain what we call the experimental pseudo-binary phase diagram here between Na2MO4 and CS2MO4. And what we have to assess with this is, so is there a miscellibility gap here? And uh, this uh, type of measurements uh, will be used to build uh, the CALFAN model and get also a lot of information about the interaction uh, terms L uh, between this, the liquids. So now I will go on the uh, examples of application of uh, the CALFAN models, because when you have your database, then uh, there, you have to use it uh, to make some, for example, uh, uh, phase diagram or uh, calculations. So first, I will talk about the database because this is what we are building. So in this database uh, project, uh, which involves Canada, France, Japan, the Netherlands, Korea, UK, and the USA, uh, you have 41 elements that are uh, in, inside this database with 206 binaries and seven, uh, uh, 76 ternaries. So again, a lot of binaries are known, but only some ternaries. Uh, so when you have this database, you can perform, uh, you can model some systems like for example, the CS2MO4 uh, MO3 system, that is also one of the systems that is uh, really uh, a key system in, uh, in my study. And so this is a pseudo-binary pseudo phase diagram, and you can have also ternary phase diagram like here between cesium, molybdenum, oxygen. And there you can choose uh, to a temperature here uh, and know uh, which phase are stable 
at this temperature in function of uh, the composition of your system, which can be really useful. And also, you can perform calculations on irradiated fuel uh, with, uh, for example, uh, following the evolution of a secondary fission product phases uh, between uh, 1,500 K to 3,500 K. So here you can recognize uh, one family of uh, fission products called the metallic precipitates, so the one that are uh, metals. Uh, and you can see here that uh, they are stable at uh, 1,500 K, but when you are starting to increase the temperature, they will melt, and the melting happens at 2,100 K. But also, you can find what we call perovskites. That is, uh, if you recognize the formula, the gray phase that I was talking about uh, before. And so you can see that they will melt at uh, nearly 2,500 K. But which is uh, important to look at it, uh, to, look, to look at, is uh, that uh, you will have a liquid forming. Therefore, you will have the dissolution of the fuel matrix in the motel perovskite. So locally, because this type of uh, compound are just local in the in the um, in the fuel, you will have the beginning of the fuel uh, of the oxide fuel melting, and the melting of the fuel matrix uh, is really at a lower temperature than expected locally. So to conclude, uh, the study of such complex systems and wide physical chemical conditions requires thermodynamic modeling of nuclear fuels uh, to have more information about oxygen potential, fission product phases, solid liquid transitions, uh, heat capacity, vo vaporization of species. Well, all what you need to know more about the, the behavior of uh, the irradiated fuel in case of uh, accidents, for example. And CALFAT is a suitable method to model this uh, well, multi-component systems by uh, extrapolation from binary and ternary subsystems. Uh, however, it is time consuming, therefore you need uh, uh, inter international uh, projects uh, to develop large databases. Uh, moreover, uh, you need to uh, va validate your databases uh, and uh, for this you have to do experimental thermodynamic measurements on the fuels that are really challenging and to do, develop the databases you can use the first principle calculations as I showed you before with the G functions and how to express the G functions with all the terms uh, to find some input for your mo models. Uh, so uh, in our database, so the TAF ID, uh, many systems are known, but there, are, there is no model for sodium systems. Therefore, the aim of uh, my work is to obtain a model for the sodium fission product systems. But uh, this is not the only system that I'm focusing in, uh, focusing on uh, uh, during my uh, my PhD. Uh, I'm also studying uh, experimentally the sodium, uranium, plutonium, oxygen system uh, in Gal GRC Karlsruhe here in Germany, uh, and it I will perform the same kind of measurements to develop in the end a thermodynamic model for these quaternary systems uh, also, but. Thermo thermodynamics alone cannot explain the fuel behavior. It has to be coupled with kinetic and mass uh, transfer models. And that's why we are uh, currently working on it uh, with the Simmer Fuel Performance Code and uh, the Open CalFAD and the TAF ID database. So I will finish my presentation with. with some um, acknowledgements uh, for uh, so to my uh, my uh, 
PhD director, Christine Geno again to Anna Smith and to Enrica Epifano. And if you want to stay in touch, uh, I put here some links about uh, the TAF ID project, uh, CEA in France, TU Delft in the Netherlands, uh, GRC Karlsruhe uh, in Germany, but uh, under the European Commission. So if you want to know more, just uh, go check these links or send me an email uh, at the, my uh, email address that is on the second slide. So I, I hope, uh, thank you for your attention and I think now I'll give you back the lead. Thank you, Wilhelm. Uh, if you have questions for the presenter today, please go ahead and type those into the questions pane. And while those are coming in, we'll just take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentation scheduled uh, in July, a presentation on the security study of sodium gas heat exchangers in the framework of sodium cooled fast reactors in August, a presentation on lead containing mainly isotope lead 208 new reflector for improving safety of fast nuclear reactors. And in September, um, a presentation on the Gen 4 coolants quality control. So, Kilam, are you able to see the questions pane? There's a question. Uh, no. Um, not in the chat pod, but in the questions pod, there's a question uh, reading. I am sorry for the out of topic question. Just want. No, I don't see uh, the questions. Just a sec, this is not. Um, According to you, the fuel is thermodynamic equilibrium during irradiation in normal conditions and accident scenarios? Um, no, because uh, that's why I was saying uh, that you need a, um, a thermo, um, to couple with kinetic and, uh, and, um, and the fuel uh, Fuel, uh, fuel codes, because uh, the time scale is uh, really, really short. So you cannot be in a thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. Uh, depend well. Uh, uh, actually, you will form the phases. Uh, so. Uh, I, I can see. Okay, uh, you you will form uh, the the phases. Uh, so this is uh, what we call thermodynamic uh, stable phases. And of course, you have to assess that these phases are are possible to form thanks to uh, PIE, so post irradiation uh, uh, experiments. And for example, uh, so uh, cesium uh, 2 molybdenum O4 uh, was said to be the most stable for, uh, phases in the joint oxide gain. And uh, re really recently, it has been demonstrated that uh, this, uh, this uh, phase is uh, the most uh, is uh, present in the fuel. So thermodynamic equilibrium, well, uh, depending on what's your your definition of uh, equilibrium. Okay. But for example, then if you also look at uh, how to manage the corium, so the long-term effects, there you have uh, way more um, 
uh, way longer uh, time. Uh, so there, the phase that are most stable, thermodynamically speaking, should be present. But again, you have to assess it with uh, uh, post-irradiation experiments. Thank you. Is there um, a similar study for MOX fuel with lead coolant? Uh, this I don't know. Uh, so, because I'm not working on lead coolants, so I don't know. Uh, there's a question asking for your email. I'll remind folks um, it is shown on the Meet the Presenter slide, the, the second slide in today's uh, presentation. The handouts um, are available in the uh, handout slide pane if you're you can download those right down and if Gillen, if you want to just say your email then um everyone would have it verbally so it's uh it's uh my first name dot my surname so uh Guilhem dot coric so uh arobaz sorry i don't know the english uh, uh name uh, C E A dot uh, F R. How do you choose which fission products are important? For example, why um, ruthenium is not included? Uh, because uh, so we we really focused on this uh, cesium well on the volatile fission products. And then what we could have in the joint oxide gain. Uh, so we decided not to include the ruthenium because uh, we had to choose. That's it. Uh, like uh, it would be really interesting to study the the behavior of the ruthenium, but uh, unfortunately we had to make some uh, decisions. So we just started the the um, the with the system cesium and barium because we had the modeling uh, of the the Kelfan model for the cesium molybdenum oxygen and the barium molybdenum oxygen okay hang on one sec we've got an email I apologize. Um, I've received an email at someone who is not able to see the question pane. It seems by your explanation that the effect of an accident with sodium cooled fast reactor is rather complicated to find out. Is it still reasonable to do this? Much research into sodium cooled concepts. Would it also apply to the dual fluid uh, reactor concept? Can you can you repeat the question? I didn't get it. Uh, Hang on, I'm gonna. Like if yes, I understand oh, correctly. Yes, slower, Berta. We do not understand. It's going too fast. I'm gonna see if I can put it in the the chat pod for you. Like if it was uh, worth it to study the sodium cool fast reactor. I've typed it. I've copied and typed it into the chat pod, not the question pod, but the chat pod because I can't access the the question pod. Um, to find out. Uh, it says it seems by your explanation. The problem is uh, with many, many reactor system that uh, you will, uh, that are chosen by the Generation 4 International Forum to understudy, uh, you have to assess the, the severe accident consequences. And uh, in severe accidents, uh, we are heating at a very high temperature and you you know you need to do research to to find out uh, what is uh, 
what is uh, happening. And uh, so I think, yes, because uh, this, uh, this type of reactor is uh, really interesting as you can uh, really close the, the, the fuel cycle. Uh, and of course, uh, if it was easy to find out uh, what's, what was happening, uh, it wouldn't be researched. So I think uh, it is totally reasonable to do this. Can you use this model to identify the chemical forms of radionuclides? Uh, the, can, can you repeat a bit slowly, please? I'm sorry. Can you use this model to identify the chemical forms of radionuclides? Ah, okay, yeah, I saw it. Uh, chemical forms of radionuclides. Uh, well, I would say yes because uh, you can you can uh, see the phases that are formed. So. Uh, your element will be like, uh, for example, a metal or combined with oxygen or, and this from uh, the phase diagram, you can, you can see the phases that will be, that are the most stable uh, under these conditions. So, yes, I think so. Thank you. Do you think to include also elements from cladding as a next step? Uh, Yes, but uh, yes, there are all the PhD uh, students working on uh, this uh, type of inter on interactions. But so my, my PhD is really focused on uh, uh, the cesium, barium, molybdenum, uh, tellurium, uh, and strontium, uranium, plutonium, oxygen. So uh, it's already a lot of work. So yeah, but yes. Have you found xenon, uh, xenon to be a strong neutron absorber or poison? Um, so on the neutron parts, I have barely, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, I can check uh, later on if you send me an email. Because uh, I was really focusing on find on a building the thermodynamic model so getting uh, input data for the modeling parts and uh, uh, that's why we want also to to do a coupling with uh, the fuel performance codes uh, to have more information about uh, the behavior of uh, uh, under irradiation and uh, because they need uh, the thermodynamic data as input also Thank you. Great questions. I don't see any additional questions. Um, so I'll take this minute to thank you again, Gilham, for your time and effort in putting this presentation together. Congratulations on a um, great acknowledgement. Uh, always a reminder to people, uh, he, he is a, a second year student, uh, and so we look forward to the great things that he will contribute um, upon graduation, and you can see that he has a very bright future. So thank you. I, I don't see any additional questions, so um, I think that'll conclude today's topic um, and presentation. Uh, thank you all for your participation and attendance, uh, and good day. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. Thank you, Bertha. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, Guillaume. Bye-bye, Bertha. Bye. Ciao.